So, if you will take out your Bibles and turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 35. And the goal tonight is Ezekiel 35 and 36. So as we look at these two chapters tonight, maybe we could um, be thinking about something that's, that's really, really important for us. And it's this, it's, do we understand how faithful God is? That's important for us to know, the faithfulness of God. We're, we're told to feed on his faithfulness. And I often find myself uh, going back to that, going back to that understanding when I don't know what's going on, when I'm confused, when I'm uh, uh, not sure what to do. I, I go back to just feeding on his faithfulness and, and just picture yourself eating a bowl of Cheerios. And you, you, you know when you eat those bowl of Cheerios, you know what you're going to get every time. Right, guys? You guys understand that. Cheerios, Honey Nut Cheerios, a lot of varieties of Cheerios, but whatever it is, you're feeding on it, and you know what you're going to get. Cheerios are tried and true. And that's just a, a terrible way to explain the faithfulness of God. We know what we're going to get in God, but how do we know that? We know because of His Word. And you know what's interesting is we feed on God's Word. There's There's... So many effects of that that we don't even realize. But, but one of the things that, that happens when we feed on God's word is we, we start to think like him. We start to see things like him. We start to understand things like him. Um, we, we get to where when something happens that's unpredictable or something that, that we don't expect that that we know God's predictable. So he's predictable even though everything isn't. And that's, that's feeding on his faithfulness. And I, I find that so comforting to know the faithfulness of God. And being in these scriptures, in, in one, the book of Ezekiel, but especially these chapters today, I, I just can't help but smile about how, how faithful God is. And I'm, I'm reading these chapters, and, and now, you know, 1,500 years later after these were written, roughly, God is faithful to do all these things. That's very encouraging to me. Because what it tells me is God is going to work according to His Word. And so when, when I understand His Word, when I'm in His Word, when I'm being refreshed by His Word, I have this stability in my life where everything else is unstable, but God is stable. And it brings a, a great amount of um, rest to my soul, peace, if you will, to my soul. But I can't wait to get into this because you got to see this. this. This is just mind-blowing what God has given the prophet Ezekiel. And as, as he's giving Ezekiel these prophecies, just like he did Jeremiah, just like he did Isaiah, just like he does Amos and pick whatever prophet you want. There's this, this theme that just keeps running through this, and it's, it's God saying, look, I do what I say. And for us to know that and to have his scriptures and to be able to see the past and him do what he said, see now him doing what he said, and then look in the future and say he's going to do what he said, it brings great comfort. But this, the chapter 35 is particularly special to me because of this. Watch, in verse 1, he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it, and say to it, Thus says the Lord God. Now, the fact that Ezekiel is saying, thus says the Lord, that means that 
God is truly speaking through an individual to the extent where it can be tested. And I love the fact that our faith is proven. I love the fact that our faith is not something where we have to wonder, am I just making this all up? I, I'm sure we all have these doubts, and you know, especially as we grow up and and maybe we've come to the, know the Lord at a younger age, and then we get a certain age, and we ask ourselves, am I just believing this because somebody told me, or am I just believing this? Um, just be, Am I crazy? Am I being brainwashed or something like that? And this is what I love about the Bible. God made it so we, we know. He, he's taken all those, those possibilities out. So when we have a doubt, like John the Baptist, remember when he doubted? But when he doubted, he asked his messengers, his disciples, to go ask Jesus about if he was the Messiah. And I love that because that's what we can do. When we doubt, we can go to Jesus and we can have everything confirmed to us. And our faith is a proven faith. And so when he says, thus says the Lord, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, if, if, if a prophet is prophesying in my name, then now they're putting themselves in the position of being killed if they're wrong. And God uses these prophets to demonstrate to, to us and give us the authority and the confidence that what we have in our scripture is actually God speaking to us. And so watch what happens. He says this, this prophecy, we know it's true. 1,500 years later, because this, he says, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against you. I will stretch out my hand against you. And, and you never want to be against God. And I will make you the most desolate, or that word most means everlasting desolation. He says, I shall lay your cities Waste and you shall be desolate. Say it with me. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I had the privilege just a few weeks ago to go to Mount Seir. You're saying, what are you talking about? What is Mount Seir? Mount Seir is actually Petra, Jordan. And I went to this place. And it's desolate. And it wasn't always desolate. It was a bustling, productive, amazing place. And I actually had the privilege to fly into Amman, Jordan, and drive in the middle of the night three hours to get to Petra. And there was nothing out there. I now know what desolate is. I've never seen desolation like that. I've been to the desert. I've been to places. I've never seen this before. And you go out and you're going through the desert and, and you're like, man, there is nothing out here. And then you get to Petra, which is an extremely cool place to go, amazing place to go. And there's... There's a, a couple hotels there just for people to stay. That it's a big tourist attraction, and these the the living situation around there is so desolate. The, the people sell trinkets to make to, to survive. And so I'm reading this, and I'm like, this this is so amazing that right now we could go there, and this is exa exactly the way it is. This is proven, and God is faithful. Now, what if, what if perhaps some entrepreneur said, you know what, I'm going to prove the Bible wrong. I'm going to go to Petra, and I'm going to build a metropolis in the middle of the desert. And there's this bustling city, and, and it grew and became this amazing thing. You know, then we can say, you know, the Bible's not true. But it's desolate. 
And it's not like that. And the Lord won't let that happen. And it's interesting because there's actually a world-renowned tourist site there, Petra, the rock city. And still, it's desolate all around there. So God's word is, is holding true. So he's, he's telling the, these certain people in this certain area, these were the Edomites. He's going to talk about them right here in verse 5. He says, Because you have had an ancient hatred and have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, when their iniquity came to an end. So he's, he's speaking about now, this goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 27, where there is these, these two twins, Jacob and Esau. And they're fighting in the womb, and, and there's this battle going on. And so Esau was the one who sort of got, got tricked into giving up his birthright. And they uh, formed tribes and they were against the children of Israel and they became what were called the Edomites, but they lived in this area. And they are hostile to the Jews and, and a lot of times in very vulnerable, vulnerable times when the Jews were coming out of Egypt and they wanted to pass through their land. They're, they're hostile to them. They, they, they didn't like them. And, and they were sort of connected. They were related. And these Edomites, as they form then when the children of Israel are being chastised by God through the Babylonians. And they, they were trying to escape the Babylonians when they went through the Edomites land, which is in Mount Seir, which is here. When they went through that land, they killed them. The Edomites killed the Jews. And so we have to really understand as we look at this whole book of Ezekiel, we have to understand it's important how we interact with the Jews. And here's, here's the kicker. So we had a, a really amazing guide in Jordan, really a wonderful guy, and he was a believer as well. And he began to explain to us, which was really surprising to me, and, and tell us, he said, you know, Jordan is very safe. And you know, a lot of times you, you think, oh, you're going to the Middle East and you're going to Jordan. People think that's a real dangerous proposition. But he's saying Jordan is really safe. And, I, and he said, the reason why, he's, he actually said, we don't have anything. We don't have any resources. He said, we're just poor. And I don't think he said desolate, but he said it in, in not so many words. He said, we just don't have anything, so there's nothing to attack. And then he's saying that, and we're looking at this vast desert. <laughs> we're like, yeah, well, there's no oil there. There's no water. And then on the bus, they showed us this um, promotional video to try to, it's like a tourism video, to try to get people to go to, to Jordan. In the, like the whole video was, there's hardly anything to do. And they're trying to like get you excited about going there. And the, the only thing that, that seemed kind of exciting was their king went into like these springs and like, you know, jumped off into the water a little bit and kind of floated down these like mini rapids, like very minimal. It's, it's almost to me as comparable to like the flower mounds, like how insignificant that is, this, you know, to name a whole town after that. But and, and no offense to Jordanians, because this is actually what the guy was telling me, but this video, and, and they said, you can't do all the stuff that the king did, because you have to get special permission for that, and he had like um, Navy SEAL, he was he was like his, their version of a Navy SEAL, and he was a military guy, and his brother was a military guy, and only they could do that, but there was really nothing to show us that would say, you know, tourism, they're, they're really the only thing to do is to go to Amman, which is just a just a big packed city, not a lot to do, and then go to Petra. And there wasn't much else there. But as as I'm reading this and I'm thinking, like I, we were just there, and he he we got into the, some of these conversations about you know Israel and the Jews, and you you can still sense 
this, I wouldn't say hatred, but dislike for the Jew, and especially because the Jews were in the land. And there's something really very important for all of us. It doesn't matter where we're from or who we are or if you know we consider ourselves Palestinian or, or whatever. What we're going to see here is really important. And it's really important to God. So for us, as we read this, we have to see, we have to have to understand God's relationship with the Jews. And we have to understand what's all involved with that so we can sort of be on God's side by having the same mind towards them. And, and it doesn't matter if, if you're in Israel, if you're in Jerusalem, if, if you're in Jordan. If you, if you have the right view of the Jew, then you're going to be blessed. That's the bottom line. And it's very interesting how Israel is, is so blessed, if you want to say, and then the surrounding areas, you know, millions of miles of population is not the same. Why is that? That's hard to mistake. So watch what he says. So he says in verse 6, he says, Therefore, as I live, says the Lord, I will prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue you, since you have not hated blood, Therefore, blood shall pursue you. So it's, in other words, they were bloodthirsty people against the Jews. So it's, it's almost this vindication. And now, so this vindication is out there for, for us to, to see and look at and say, you know what? God, when we see Petra and we see Jordan, that this is proof that God is right. And so in verse 7, he says, Thus I will make Mount Seir most desolate and cut off from it the one who leaves and the one who returns. And I will fill its mountains with your slain on your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines. Those who are slain by the sword shall fall. I will make you perpetually desolate. See that? And your cities shall be uninhabited. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So there are things that God gives us to say, look, now you know that I'm the Lord. Look at Petra, Jordan. Now you know that I'm the Lord. And so how many of those things do we actually need? How many marks or proofs or demonstrations do we need? And, and I would, without a doubt, say there is absolutely nothing even close to anything that you can believe that will be substantiated like the things of God. And he made it that way. Right? So, so we have to be careful that we don't just believe because we want to or because somebody's persuasive. And I, I encourage you not to just believe what I say. But look at the word and just for your own. You see God on your own. But it, 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 his word is never going to be proved wrong. So in verse 10, he says, Because you have said these two nations, so the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Israel, when they are split, and these two countries, you, you said they shall be mine. And we will possess them, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord, I will do according to your anger and according to the envy which you showed in your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you then you shall know that I am the Lord. But see, that's really heavy. Because it's amazing to see the continual 
bitterness that can run in a person's heart even to the downfall or the continual downfall of a person. In James chapter 3, it says, if, if we have bitter envy in our heart, that there is confusion and every evil thing. So think about that. If in our heart there's bitter envy, bitter envy and it also says self-seeking, if that's in our heart, there is nothing good. We can't make any good decisions. We're not going to be thinking right. We're not going to have the right approach to life. And, it, and James says that that's actually, actually demonic. So it's, it's demonic, earthly, and sensual, he says. So if we're struggling with bitterness or envy or self-seeking, we need to stop making excuses for that and justifying it, and we need to repent from that. And I, I'm saying that as, as lovingly as I can because as we see in our text, bitterness and envy is so destructive. And we're all so susceptible to that. We're all so susceptible to look at somebody else and envy them and, and look at what people have. Our society is set up for that to get us to want what we don't have instead of being content in the Lord. But if we have that in our heart, there's nothing good going to come from that. And so we need to repent from that. And we need to say, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. And we need to make sure that our hearts are right with God. Because as we see in our text, that only desolation can come from that envy. But think about Esau and just years and years and years of envy, and it still goes on today. Still goes on today. And you, you may say Esau was sort of justified in being angry. His birthright was stolen. And I get that, but it doesn't excuse envy. At, at some point, you just have to say, Lord, whatever you want to do with my life, whatever you want to do with me, it's okay by me. And not look at circumstances and say, I'm a victim of my circumstances, but instead say, Lord, you're sovereign all over all those things. And you, you're working a plan that I don't understand. So, Lord, your will be done. In verse 12, it says, Then you shall know that I'm the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemies, blasphemies, which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, they are desolate. They are given to us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me. You notice that? As, as, they're, as they're going against the children of Israel, they're going against God. God looked at that as like, you're going against me. And, the mul uh, and you multiplied your words against me, and he says, I have heard those things. Verse 14, thus says the Lord God, the whole earth will rejoice when I make you desolate. As you rejoiced because the inheritance of the house of Israel was desolate, so I will do to you. You shall be desolate, O Mount Seir, as well as all Edom, all of it. Then... They shall know that I am the Lord. Chapter 36. Switching gears. And you, O son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. So in God's faithfulness, now what we're going to see is maybe two sides of the coin or two edges of the sword. So we see what happens when we come against God, when we rebel against God. So we see God is actually faithful in judging when we go against God. So he's, he's faithful in judging sin, let's say that. God is faithful to judge sin. He's so faithful that he judged his own son who became sin. That's pretty faithful, right? He, he didn't 
say, okay, well, not in this case. And he's fa faithful to judge sin. This is the amazing thing about the gospel. That he judges his own son so that we would not have to. See, God could not overlook our sin or he wouldn't be faithful to his word. He wouldn't be faithful to himself. He couldn't overlook his word and say, you know, that, that person is sinning, so I like them, so I'm not going to deal with that. But instead, he sent his son to die for us. That's how faithful God is. And he even judged his own people. And, and as we see this, all these things that he's doing are to show us, look, look how I judged Israel when they rebelled against me. You, will you know that I'm the Lord? Look how I judged the nations that came against Israel. Will you know that I'm the Lord? Look at all these things I'm doing. Will you know that I'm the Lord? And so now with, with the children of Israel, as they're in a condition of, of being under God's judgment and Babylon as captives and their city wiped out, now he, he tells Israel, he says, look, I'm still faithful because God had a covenant with Israel, right? So in, in the Israelites, we've seen some of their thoughts of, of thinking, man, uh, I guess, you know, God's promise to Abraham, it's all for naught now. You know, I, I guess all the, these things. And, and so Ezekiel is now telling them, he says, God, despite you, God's going to be faithful to his word. And, and he's doing that by now. He's prophesying to the mountains. This is really cool. The mountains of Israel. In verse 2, he says, Thus says the Lord God, Because the enemy has said of you, Aha, which is when that, that is a bad thing. When the enemies say that against Israel, Aha, that's always bad. The ancient heights have become our possession. So the enemies are saying, Aha, Israel's weak. They're being judged. Now we can go in. And, and God's saying, because you're saying that, because I gave them this land, and now I've taken them out, and you're, you're being opportunistic, and, and you're drooling and sal sal uh, salivating and saying, oh, man, we're going to go in there. But here's the thing. Israel's been out of the land a couple times. And the land has been taken over by people who hate Israel. And the land... When the enemies have the land, it never does well. Why? The land only does well when the Jews are there. So watch this. He says in verse 3, he says, Therefore prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, Because, you made, because they made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side, so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations. And you are taken up by the lips of talkers and slandered by the people. He says, therefore, O mountains of Israel. In other words, God, God is saying, I've seen everything that's going on. He, he's not exonerating Israel. Think about that. They're being judged right now. But he's also saying that doesn't give us an excuse to come against Israel. God is dealing with them and he will deal with them. But we have to make sure we understand that God has a relationship, a special relationship with Israel and the Jew. And we have to accept that. And it's evil and satanic to have an anti-Semitic attitude. We, we see that. We've always seen that, right? And we see that now. But know this, that's, that's demonic. Okay? Because God is still working with them. That's what we're seeing here. And so watch what he says in verse 4. He says, Therefore, o, o mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. He says, Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, the desolate wastes, the cities that have been forsaken, which became plunder and mockery to the rest of the nations all around? He says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely I've spoken in my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations and against Edom, 
who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and spiteful minds in order to plunder its open country. God's saying that this land is special and specific and to be used in a certain way. And he's saying, and, and if you read about the different occupations of those lands over the years, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, the, the Romans over that area, you see judgment. Because, and this is a disputed thing, unfortunately it shouldn't be, because you just read this and you know, God wants that land for those people. Bottom line, you can't read this and not come up with that. The land was a, a promise that God gave to the children of Israel. The land was part of that. That's important. And when people go in there and they desolate the land, we see judgment. We see God coming against him. He doesn't want people to use and abuse the land that he gave his children. And so in verse 6, he says, Therefore, prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and my fury because you have borne the shame of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath, and surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. Verse 8, But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. This is one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible that you can read. Because this chapter in the Bible, one, is, is written when the nation of Israel is in captivity. And it's also written in a way where we can't mistake the fact that God was going to, after they were going to be out of the land again, that eventually they were going to be in the land for good. And that's what we see now. So they are taken out of the land by the Babylonians for 70 years. They went back into the land and they were there until the Romans took it over in 70 AD. They are scattered around the whole world. And then in 1948, the Lord brought them back. This tells us that 1,500 years before it happened. And it's hard to mistake what the Lord is trying to show us here. And, and when someone would say that Israel, one, doesn't have a right to the land, they're coming against God, and they're coming against His word. And if, if someone would say that God is not dealing with the Jews anymore, he's done with the Jews, and that the church is now spiritual Israel, so to speak, I don't know how you deal with the fact that Israel in 1948 is back in the land, and how this prophecy is being fulfilled, and how God has a future plan for Israel that's going to be fulfilled, and we're going to see that in a second. But he's straight out saying that this land, when you're there, this land is going to produce for you. And it, this is another thing that's, that's very personal to me, because just weeks ago, I was there, and our guide, who's about 30 years old and lived there his whole life, could not believe and kept saying this over and over again. 
I can't believe how green everything is. I can't believe how the land is flourishing like this. He says he's never seen it like that. And so we're hearing out of the mouth of a native Jew whose parents are from there. And we're hearing exactly what's being said here. Now, before 1948, maybe to you that's not a big deal, but if you understand the history, the land was desolate and a swamp land before the Jews came back. So keep that in mind. So in, in verse 9, let me just read that again. He says, For indeed, I am for you. He's telling the Jews, I am for you. If God is saying that to Jews, well, I want to be in that too. Right? I, I want to I see that and say, you know, I need to, to pray. I, I should not come against the Jew. I should be praying for them. I should be praying for their land because God's for them. And he says, and I will turn to you and you shall be tilted, I'm sorry, tilled and sown. And I will multiply men upon you and the house of Israel, all of it, and the cities shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. That's exactly what's happening. And this is what's so amazing, one, about our faith, and two, about going to Israel. You can go there and see this. And this last time we went, it was so amazing because I got to see these two chapters. I got to see desolation. I got to see flourishing. And I'm just, my mind is going, God, you're so good. You're so amazing. You're doing exactly what you said 1,500 years ago. And you'd be able to walk. You, you, you'd be able to see these things. And you'd be able to see the land. One thing that Justin was saying, who, hi, Justin, if you're listening. But he went with us. And he, he kept saying, look at all those cranes. Because they're building so much stuff. And there's cranes all over. And you're like, man, look at all these cranes. There's so much going on. And so when we read this, it's like, man, this is, this is I can't believe we live in this time. We're seeing this happen. And when in verse 12, he says, I will cause men to walk on you. He's talking about the mountains. You know what's so crazy? I walked. On those mountains. And as you look and go up these mountains, Mount Carmel, there's a bunch of different mountains you can go on, Mount Tabor, and you go on these mountains and you can look over the land and you see the Jezreel Valley and Megiddo, Valley of Megiddo, on Mount Carmel, you can look one direction and see Syria, look the other direction and see the Mediterranean Sea. You see the whole width of the state in one view or the country in one view. And here it says, I will cause men to walk on you, my people of Israel. They shall take possession of you, and you shall be their inheritance. No more shall you bereave them of children. In other words, God's saying, you're going, there, there's going to be people coming. And so now for the first time, in history, more people live in Israel, more Jews live in Israel than live outside of Israel. So since 19, actually the 1800s when people slowly started coming to Israel, and then 1948 when it became a nation, Jews have been coming back home to Israel. And now for the first time ever, there are more Jewish people in Israel, in Israel since the diaspora, I guess, since the Roman Empire scattered them around, than in the whole world. So what does that mean? That tells us something. That tells us God's gathering his people in the land because he's about to deal with them specifically. And when does he do that? In the Bible, he does that during the tribulation. But so he has to gather them all in the land to do that. So how close are we to the rapture of the church, which is, I believe, before the seven-year tribulation. So how close are we? We're close. In verse 13, he says, Thus says the Lord God, Because they say to you, You devour men and bereave your nation of children. So that's what the spies were saying when they went into the land. You remember that? 
They went in the land and they're almost saying, God, you're going to kill us. We can't go in here. They didn't believe him. And they're being indicted here because of their lack of faith. In verse 14, he says, Therefore you shall devour men no more, nor bereave your nation any more, says the Lord, nor will I let you hear the taunts of nations any more, nor bear the reproach of the peoples any more, nor shall you cause your nation to stumble any more, says the Lord. So, so now we know this, this is written out as a, as a near and far fulfillment. The near fulfillment was when they came back into the land after being exiled to Babylon. But here we get, we know that after they're back into the land, verse 15 actually happened. Taunts, reproach, things like that, stumbling. We know that's happening. So we, we know, and we're going to get more of that going forward here. We know that means there's a, this is speaking also of a future fulfillment there's going to be a time when, when the Jews will have absolute, complete peace and won't be looked at the way they're looked at now. Look at verse 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. So he's getting a lot of stuff now. And he says, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me... Their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood that they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. So, sometimes we think, well, the children of Israel, like, are they a cut above? Are they, you know, better than everybody else? And we, we think things like that. And and what God is saying that we're all the same. We're all sinners. And Israel messed up too. They messed up so bad. They were given so much. And they messed up so bad that God had to take them out of the land. So they're guilty of that. And then all those people who took advantage of the land and went in there because the Jews were out, didn't recognize that that was the Jewish land. All those people, they're being judged too. And it gives me this idea that you know sometimes we want to have all these sides. In reality, we're all guilty we all need a savior we all need to come to the saving knowledge of jesus christ so in verse 19 he says so i scattered them among the nations do you see that prophecy see when he is writing this they're just scattered to babylon right do you see so after 70 a.d when the the romans ultimately conquered them and, and dispersed them, destroyed the temple. When that happened, they're scattered around, around the nations. They're around the whole world. And, and they were able to, because of God, maintain their identity, their heritage, their religion, even being scattered around the whole world. So it says that um, when they're dispersed throughout the countries, he says, I judge them according to their ways and their deeds. So that was judgment when the Jews were out of the land. But I want you to just keep in your mind how important the land was to God and how important it is to him that the Jews are in the land. In verse 20, it says, When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. So that's what happened when the Jews were scattered. They were looked upon as, as look at these people that God gave them so much and, and they blew it and they're messed up. That, and that was a lot of why they're persecuted around the world. And another, well, most modern big reason that they're persecuted, especially by Christians, people that I wouldn't associate with, like the Crusaders or um, the Roman Catholic Church is because um, they would say that the Jews killed Jesus. So that's, I, I don't know how somebody would come to that conclusion because in a way we all killed Jesus. Our sin killed Jesus. But then 
the Father killed Jesus for us. Because the, the Bible actually says that it pleased the Father in Isaiah 53, actually pleased him that he would send his son to die to us. And that's really amazing, isn't it? But what's amazing is, to me, another thing that's amazing is, is how Satan has manipulated so many people against the Jews, and he's doing that now. And you have to ask yourself, if, like, this is another thing to me that proves the Bible to be true. It's why is there so much hatred towards the Jewish people? And it's inspired by Satan. And the big picture of that is before Jesus came, Satan was, gonna, was trying to stop the Messiah who would come through the Jews. And so that's why Herod killed all the children under two. That's why Pharaoh killed all the male Jews. That's why we see hatred. That's why Hitler tried to kill the Jews. It's in, inspired and driven by Satan. And yet, through all that, we see God working against these satanic plans to keep Israel out of the land, and now they're there. And why are they there now? It's because we're set up for God to deal with them specifically. And in order to do that, the church has to be gone. That's why I believe, one of the reasons I believe the rapture of the church is going to happen before the tribulation, because if you understand what the tribulation is, it's where God deals with Jewish the Jewish nation. Now, there are many Jews that are saved and believe in Christ. But as a nation, he's, they're all going to come back as a nation to Christ. And the process of that happening is going to be through the tribulation. And the fulfillment of that is going to be in the millennial kingdom. That's what we're going to see here. The fulfillment of the full restoration of the Jew is going to happen in the millennial kingdom, which is after the tribulation. So in verse 20, it says, When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. And when they said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet... They have gone out of his land, but I had concern for my holy name. Isn't that interesting? Which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Man, I, I was reading that. I'm just, when we carry the name of Christ, that really means something, you know? The Bible says that we've been bought with a price. We're no longer our own. And I think that, you know, that's something we have to really consider when we carry the name of Christ. What that means, are we truly representing Christ? And nobody's perfect, but to flagrantly live our life in a way that would say and do the opposite of Christ is profaning the name of Christ. Have you ever thought about that? That we can profane the name of Christ? And think about maybe giving the wrong impression about Christ by how we do things, how we live. And I want us just to be thinking about that. And again, nobody is perfect, but I think we should be concerned about how we represent Christ, how we re represent him on our social media. Think about that. How we represent, you know, sometimes... We get so caught up in political things, we think there's a bigger picture than maybe our disagreement with somebody. The bigger picture is, are they saved or not? Do we care about their salvation? Whoever is our president, do we, do we care about their salvation? Or do we just are mad and angry about them for what they're doing? So in verse 22, he says, Therefore, say to the house of, the, of Israel... Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but I do it for my holy namesake. So that's really important because it gives us an idea that there's nothing 
inherently special about the Jew, and there's nothing inherently special about any of us or any nationality. We don't need to divide. We're all sinners. And there, we look for reasons to divide, in, you know, whether it's skin color, nationality, politics. I even see, there, there, I'm wondering if there's going to be a big divide in the church between maskers and non-maskers. You don't wear a mask? Oh, you wear a mask? Hey, we got to get off of that. You know, everybody stands and falls before God on their own. So let's not divide if you're a masker or not a masker. If you want to be a masker, more power to you. If you don't, more power to you too. But let's not divide over masking. Okay, I'm probably going to get people mad at me for that. But stop dividing. Okay, we're all one in Christ. Verse 23, I got to hurry up. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but I do it for my holy name's sake. Verse 23, And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed before your eyes. For I will take you from among the nations got to get this. Please circle this. I will take you from the nation. I'll gather you out of the countries and bring you into your own land. Whose land is it? God gave him the land. He's going to do that. And he did that. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. What does that sound like? That's the new covenant. And this is going to be ultimately fulfilled in the new, in the millennial kingdom. But God is doing that now. And he's fulfilling that. He's fulfilled that in us, right? He's given us a new heart. And he's put a new spirit within us. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Circle that because that's what God has done in the cro at the cross. He's given us a new heart, a new heart that desires God, that longs for God, that craves for God. That's why when we go against those things, we're going against our new nature and we feel the friction. So are we truly born again? Do we have a new heart? If it's not friction for us to sin against God, then maybe that's our nature. Maybe that's really our nature. If we're not convicted of our sin, then maybe that's our nature. That's something to be very concerned about. He says in verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk on my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. That's what's amazing. God gives us the Holy Spirit. And so as we become a new creation in Christ, he works in us and through us. So he gives us the will to do his will. And then he gives us the power to do his will and the na nature to want to do his will. That's the new covenant. That's the new testament. That's the new deal that we have in Christ. Verse 28, then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. I will deliver you. From all your uncleanness, I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of your trees. See, that's how we know we're close. God is doing this now. Right? But the ultimate fulfillment is in the millennial kingdom. So it's at least seven years away. But he's doing that now. That's how we know we're close. I will increase your fields. He's doing that now. So that... You need never again to bear the reproach of famine among the nation. So we know that Israel will never be out of the land again. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. This is the national repentance of Israel. 
And we see it's the kindness of the Lord that will bring them to repentance. They're going to be broken when they experience the goodness of the Lord. And we're seeing the beginning of that now. We're seeing the breaking because of the goodness of the Lord in the land. In verse 32, Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord. Let it be known to you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, On that day I will cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. That's what's happening now. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say the land was desolate and has become like the Garden of Eden. That's what's happening now. And the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. That's what's happening now. Then the nations which are left all around you shall what? Shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as a holy holy sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem on its feast days. So shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. And what? Then... Say it with me. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So amazing, amazing chapter. And I just would encourage you again, if you have the opportunity to go to Israel, uh, Lord willing, we're planning on going in 2022. And um, man, you can walk in these places and read things like that. And you say, he did this. He's doing this. So be encouraged. God is faithful. And maybe, you know, this time of quarantine has feel like, uh, you know, maybe the children of Israel as they're they're taken out of the land. But use this time to make sure that you're right with the Lord. And use this time to feed on God's faithfulness. God's going to work out His plan. Be on his side. Don't come against it. And let's remember, let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Let's pray as we finish out. And um, all of us here say hi, and we love you very much and miss you very much. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together. I pray a blessing on everyone listening, Lord. I pray that they would be encouraged. And, And Lord, for anybody out there who is not a Christian, who does not have a new heart, who has not been born again, whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, I pray for them now that they would turn to you, that they would ask you to forgive them of their sins, that they would trust in who you are and what you've done, and that right now would be their moment of salvation. And if that's you, just cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Can't wait to do communion with you on Sunday.